When I discovered the world of modern ambient music, my honest first thought was, oh, that seems pretty easy. I can do that. There really didn't seem to be a lot going on, either harmonically or melodically, which were the main points of focus for me as a composer up until that point. So, as anyone would, I grabbed a slow, evolving pad in Serum, threw some black hole reverb on it, and uh, just drowned it entirely. And you know, that actually sounded pretty good to me. So I was like, well, I'll just make some stuff with these sounds and I'll be an ambient artist. Then I tried to add another layer to that, and then another one. And of course, everyone was equally drowned in reverb, on an insert, of course. And within the span of about two minutes, I had completely ruined it. It sounded like an absolute blurry mess. Hmm. Maybe there's more to this than I thought. I only really discovered this loosely defined genre called ambient music about a decade ago. Late to the party, I know. I had been pretty intensely focused on my studies as a classical pianist, organist, and composer. But I'd also grown up on progressive rock. Thanks, Dad. There was one band in particular that I really loved and stood out from all of the rest to me. They had this ability to not only shred, and clearly they were all virtuosos with their instruments, but they could also kind of get the listener lost in this bed of ethereal textures from time to time when they would slow things down and pull things back. There were all these weird sounds coming and going that I had no idea how they were even making. That band was called Yes. And thinking back on it, I guess Yes was my first exposure to anything remotely resembling ambient music, even if it was usually tucked away in a 20-minute rock epic. Fast forward to about 10 years ago, and I was exposed to artists like Olafur Arnolds and Nils Fromm. That kind of reignited my passion for synthesizers and all of these electronic instruments that they were using. They had this nostalgic vintage tape sound going on that I found to be really creative and much more accessible than the tape music I had been exposed to up until that point, which was in the art music world of the more avant-garde. So from there, I naturally thought, well, who else is making music in this kind of style? And I discovered other ambient artists like Hammock and Slow Meadow and my good friend now, Tony Anderson, who has been a guest on this channel a couple of times. And I remember very specifically sitting in my crappy little first studio, trying to hear what I could over the traffic noise outside, and being really struck by the sounds that they were using, the depth of their mixes, all of these incredible textures that, again, I had no idea how they were achieving. It seemed three-dimensional when I was listening to it. All of these seemingly very different textures fit together really well. And it remained a mystery to me, despite me trying to make it inside of Cubase, until I started using some hardware. Eventually, I tracked things all the way back to the source, Brian Eno, who is largely considered to be the father of ambient music. And Eno was using hardware, tape machines, synthesizers out of necessity. That's kind of all there was back then. And it forced him to be creative within a set of limitations. What you need are fewer possibilities that are more interesting. Um, you know, the whole emphasis of synthesizer design has been towards giving you more and more options. It's not more options that you want, it's more useful options. Now, I don't have any hardware to sell you today. I don't review gear anymore. And I really don't think you need hardware to make any kind of music anymore. But for me, I did need that experience with hardware early on, just to fully wrap my brain around how a piece of gear can inspire you through its limitations. Using hardware totally changed the way I thought about making electronic music in general. As a pianist and organist, I really appreciated the ability to be more hands-on with an instrument and actually reach out and grab things. When I was in the box, I had this sterile environment and seemingly unlimited choices, and that just overwhelmed me 
and everything kind of sounded the same. I wasn't very inspired because there was no inherent character to any of the things that I was using in the box, or at least I didn't know how to get character out of anything that I was using in the box. This is what kids today, and probably some 32 year old in the comment section, would call a skill issue. And in my case, that's completely accurate, though a bit uninspired as an insult at this point. But something happened after I started using hardware and was forced into these limitations. I then understood how to implement those limitations inside a DAW as well. And that's the whole point of me bringing it up. I'm not trying to sell you a synth here. I'm trying to show you how to skip that step if you don't have any hardware of your own. And maybe you can start to make more interesting things in the box that you'll find inspiring to use. Let me show you an example. When I got into Eurorack, I was really intrigued by the amount of inspiration I could find just in playing with a simple clock divider. And I had never experienced anything like that in the software world. Nothing so hands-on, direct, and relatively simple that actually unlocked a whole world of possibilities for me. Now I do similar things in Ableton with this Ableton Live device, which, by the way, I highly recommend, though I'm not sponsored by them. Overall, I've started to create maybe more simple elements. And I don't mean uninteresting elements, I mean elements that are maybe in mono, so that I can layer them more easily and they don't blur together. Maybe elements that are band passed, so that once again, when I stack them in layers, everything feels like it has its specific place to live. This is one of the most important things in making the kind of sound beds and textures that I find the most interesting. But of course, I cannot completely ignore the 25 years of classical training that I've had. And to me, the real challenge and the real fun is finding interesting ways of combining those two worlds. The interesting sounds from ambient music and maybe the more interesting harmonic and melodic ideas from the classical, more traditional world. I think there are a lot of time-tested concepts that have stood the test of time for centuries that we can apply to any genre and still get a lot of use out of. And oddly enough, if you use these older concepts in new ways, suddenly your music sounds fresh and interesting because other people aren't doing that. Most people spend their time chasing whatever is trendy right now without fully realizing that those are probably also the things that will be forgotten by tomorrow. If you'd like to know more about the specifics of the things that I found most helpful musically, I have a free ebook that will walk you through those concepts that are my favorites and that I use in my own music. That's linked in the description below. The OG ambient godfather himself, Eno, said that ambient music should be as ignorable as it is interesting. For a long time, I didn't fully understand that because it's never been a personal goal of mine to write ignorable music. But the way I've come to interpret that is that there's plenty of unexplored space within the world of ambient music. It can be used to create incredibly beautiful textures that will transport the listener without them having to focus on it too intently. It's just beautiful. But it can also have another level to it of depth and craft for those active listeners who want to peel back those layers. And I think that initial emotional weight that this kind of music can carry pulls the listener in and that sort of depth and memorability keeps the listener there. And that's exactly the kind of thing that I want to create with my own music. So I think the very best ambient music is deceptively simple. The key is not to let the hidden complexities become a distraction. And that is a skill that goes far beyond just slapping some reverb on your favorite synth or field recording. 
If you'd like to support my ability to make more videos, I don't do sponsorships on this channel, but you can click the little join button down below and buy me a cup of coffee every month. I would truly appreciate it. Thanks as always for watching, and I'll see you next time.